This play is called Our Town. It is written by Thornton Wilder and produced by Lori Carroll and stage managed by me, Riley Edenbeck. In it, you will see Anna Johnston, Isabella Ritter, Rowan Adams, Aaron Rothkoff, Griffin Rabin, Laura Street, Madeline Sturdivant, and Brooklyn Canty as the stage manager. The name of our town is Grover's Corners, New Hampshire, but we can't show you our town because, well, you know why not. So we're just going to drop in on a few folks around town. The first act shows a day in our town. The date is May 7th, 1901, just before dawn. The morning star always gets wonderful bright the minute before it has to go. Well, as I said, it's, it's early morning. Here's Miss Gibbs. She was Julia Hersey before she married Dr. Gibbs. Now Myrtle, I have got to tell you something because if I don't tell somebody, I'll burst. Now Myrtle, did one of those secondhand furniture men from Boston come to see you last Friday? Well, he called on me and first I thought he was a patient just waiting to see the doctor. Then he wormed his way into my parlor and Myrtle Webb, he offered me $350 for Grandmother Wentworth's high boy <laughs> as I'm sitting here. Gosh, that old thing, I didn't know where to put it. It was so big, and I almost gave it to Cousin Hester Wilcox. Well, I don't know if I'm going to take it. <sighs> well, if I could get the doctor to take the money and go away someplace on a trip, I'd sell it like that. You know, Myrtle, it's been the dream of my life to see Paris. Oh, I don't know, it sounds crazy, I suppose, but for years I've been promising myself that if we ever got the chance, and I beat about the bush a little and said that if I ever got my legacy, that's what I call it, he'd take me. But you know how he is. <laughs> I haven't heard a serious word out of him since I've known him. No, he said it might make him discontented with Grover's Corners to go traipsing about Europe and better let well enough alone, he says. And then every two years, he makes a trip to the battlefields of the Civil War, and that's enough treat for anybody, he says. Come. It's a fact. Dr. Gibbs is never so happy as when he's at Antietam or Gettysburg. At the times I've walked over those hills, Myrtle, stopping at every bush and pacing it out like we were going to buy the thing. I'm, I'm sorry I even mentioned it. It only seems to me that once in your life before you die, you ought to see a country where they don't talk in English and don't even want to. The first act was called The Daily Life. This act is called Love and Marriage. So, now we'll scoop ahead. It's three years later. It's 1904. It's July 7th, just after high school commencement. That's, a, that's the time most of our young people jump up and get married. Well, Ma, the day has come. You're losing one of your chicks. The groom's up shaving himself only. There ain't an awful lot to shave. Whistling and singing like he's happy to leave us. Every now and then he says, I do, to the mirror, but it don't sound very convincing to me. Oh, Frank, go on with you. I remember my wedding morning, Julia. I was the scaredest young fellow in the state of New Hampshire. I thought I'd made a mistake for sure. When I saw you coming down that aisle, I thought you were the prettiest girl I'd ever seen. Only trouble was I'd never seen you before. There I was in the congregational church marrying a total stranger. And how do you think I felt, Frank? Weddings are perfectly awful things. Do you know what I was most afraid of when I married you? Mm -hmm. I was afraid we wouldn't have enough material for conversation more than last us a few weeks. <laughs> I thought we'd run out and eat our meals in silence. That's a fact. Well, you and I have been conversing for 
20 years now without any noticeable barren spells. Good morning, Mr. Webb. Good morning, George. Mr. Webb, you don't believe in that superstition, do you? There's a lot of common sense in superstition, George. Gee, I wish a person could just get married with all that marching up and down. Every man that's ever lived has felt that way, George, but it isn't any use. It's the woman folk who built up weddings, my boy. For a while now, the women have it all to their own. A man's pretty small at a wedding, George. All those good women standing shoulder to shoulder, making sure the knot's tied in a mighty public way. Well, you do believe in it, don't you, Mr. Webb? Yes. Oh, yes. Now, don't misunderstand me, George. Marriage is a wonderful thing. A wonderful thing. And don't you forget that. No, sir. How old were you uh, when you got married? Well, you see, I've been off to college and I'd taken some time to get settled in, but Miss Webb, she wasn't much older than what Emily is now. Oh, age hasn't got much to do with it, George, compared with other things. What were you gonna say, Mr. Webb? I don't know. Was I gonna say something? George. I was remembering the other night the advice my father gave me when I got married. Yes. He said, Charles, he said, start right off showing who's boss. Best thing to do is to give a command about something, even if it doesn't make sense, just so she'll learn to obey. And then he said, if anything about her irritates you, a conversation or anything, get right up and walk out the house. That'll make it clear to her. And, oh, yes. He said, never let your wife know how much money you have. Never. Well, I couldn't exactly... No, so I took the exact opposite of his advice, and I've been happy ever since. Let that be a lesson to never ask advice to anybody on personal matters. Now I have to interrupt again here. You see, we want to know how this all began. This wedding, this plan to spend a lifetime together. George and Emily are gonna show you now the conversation they had when they first knew that, as the saying goes, they're meant for one another. Hello, George. Hello, Emily. What do you have? Why, Emily Webb, what have you been crying about? She got an awful scare, Mrs. Morgan. That the hardware store wagon almost ran over her. I'll have a strawberry phosphate, Miss Morgan. No, no, Emily, have a soda with me. Well... Two strawberry ice cream sodas, Mrs. Morgan. Two strawberry ice cream sodas, yes, sir. Yes, Miss Ellis, I'll be with you in a minute. They're so expensive. No, no, Emily, you don't think of that. We're celebrating. Our election. You know what else I'm celebrating? I'm celebrating because... I've got a friend who tells me all the things that ought to be told me. Oh, George, please don't think of that. I don't know why I said it. It's not true. You're... Well, Emily, I'm glad that you spoke to me the way that you did about that fault in my character. What you said was right. But there was one thing wrong in it. And that's where you said I wasn't noticing people. And you, for instance, said you were watching people while you were doing everything. Why? I was doing the same thing for you. Why, I always thought as you as one of the chief people I thought about. I always made sure where you were sitting on the bleachers and who you were sitting with. And for three days now, I've been trying to walk home with you, but something's always gotten in the way. Oh, why, George, life's awful funny. How could I have known that? I, I thought... Listen, Emily, I'm going to tell you why I'm not going to agricultural school. I feel that once you found someone that you're very fond of, and I mean a person who's very fond of you too, and likes you well enough to be interested in your character. Well, I feel that that's just as important as agricultural school, if not more so, that's what I think. I think that's awfully important too. Emily? Yes, George? Emily, if I do improve and make a big change, would you be, I mean, could you be? I. I am now, and I always have been. 
This time, nine years have gone by, friends. Summer 1913. This here is the new part of the cemetery. Yes, an awful lot of sorrow has sort of quieted down up here. We all know how it is. A lot of thoughts come up here day and night, but there's no post office. Now, there are some things that we all know, but we don't take them out and look at them very often. We all know that something is eternal. And it ain't houses, and it ain't names, and it ain't earth, and it ain't even the stars. We all know in our bones that something is eternal. And that something has to do with human beings. All the greatest people ever lived have been telling us that for, for 5,000 years. And yet you'd be surprised how people are always letting go of that fact. There's something way down deep that's eternal about every human being. Aren't they waiting for the eternal part in them to come out clear? There's your friend, Mrs. Gibbs, and Mrs. Soames, who enjoyed the wedding so much, <laughs> remember? Oh, and a lot of others. Hello. Hello, Emily. Hello, Mother Gibbs. Hello, Emily. It's raining. Yes, they'll be gone soon, dear. Just rest yourself. Mother Gibbs, George and I have made that farm into just the best place you ever saw. We thought of you all the time. We wanted to show you the new barn and a great long cement drinking fountain for the stock. We bought that out of the money you left us. I did? Don't you remember, Mother Gibbs, the legacy you left us? Why, it was over $350. Oh, yes, yes, Emily. Live people don't understand, do they? No, dear, not very much. They're sort of shut up in little boxes, aren't they? Oh, Mother Gibbs, I never realized before how troubled and how, how in the dark live persons are. From morning till night, that's all they are. Troubled. I know. Look, they're finished. They're going. But, Mother Gibbs, one can go back. One can go back there again into living. I feel it. I know it. Don't do it, Emily. Emily, don't. It's not what you'd think it'd be. But I won't live over a sad day. I'll choose a happy one. I'll choose the day I first knew I loved George. Oh, no? No? Why should that be painful? You not only live it, but you watch yourself living it. Yes. And as you watch it, you see the thing that they, down there, never know. You see the future. You know what's going to happen afterwards. I choose my 12th birthday. All right. It's February 11th, 1899. A Tuesday. Where's my girl? Where's my birthday girl? Well now, dear, a very happy birthday to my girl and many happy returns. There are surprises waiting for you on the kitchen table. I can't bear it. They're so young and beautiful. Why did they ever have to get old? Mama, I'm here. I've grown up. I love you all. Everything. I can't look at everything hard enough. Good morning, Mama. But, birthday or no birthday, I want you to eat your breakfast good and slow. I want you to grow up and be a good, strong girl. Oh, Mama, just look at me one minute as though you really saw me. Mama, 14 years have gone by. I'm dead. Your grandmother, Mama. I married George Gibbs, Mama. Wally's dead, too. Mama, his appendix burst on a camping trip to Crawford Notch. We felt just terrible about it. Don't you remember? But just for a moment, now we're all together. Mama, just for a moment, let's be happy. 
Let's look at one another. That in the yellow paper is something I found in the attic among your grandmother's things. You're old enough to wear it now and I thought you'd like it. I can't. I can't go on. It goes so fast. We don't have time to look at one another. I didn't realize. So all that was going on and we never noticed. Take me back up the hill to my grave. But first, wait, one more look. Goodbye. Goodbye, world. Goodbye, Grover's Corners, Mama and Papa. Goodbye to clocks ticking and, and butternut trees and Mama's sunflowers and food and coffee and new iron dresses and hot baths and sleeping and waking up. Oh, world. You're too wonderful for anyone to realize you. Do any human beings realize life while they live it? Every, every minute? No. Saints and poets, maybe. They do some. I'm ready to go back. Most everybody's asleep in Grover's Corners. There are the stars. Doing their old crisscross in the skies. Scholars haven't quite settled the matter yet, but they seem to think there are no living beings up there. Just chalk or a fire. Only this one is straining away. Straining away to make something of itself. And the strain so great that every 16 hours, everybody lies down and, and gets a rest. Hmm. 11 o'clock in Grover's Corners. Everybody's resting in Grover's Corners. Tomorrow's going to be another day. You should get a good rest too. Good night.